today is the first day in my life and probably, probably the only one in uh, which my uh, own income fell dramatically because until yesterday I was paid as a, a professor ordinaire of this uh, university at about 50% more than what I'm being paid from today on and as a pensioner. Right? Uh, this is, uh, uh, but I mean, does it see, it's not a big shock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, that's not the way. Uh, Alexander wanted us to uh, uh, to show you this uh, picture, which is one of the pictures of the executive committee, one we had in uh, Florence uh, during the year I spent there, just before uh, starting the, the Hoover Share 25 years ago, and I'm going back to Florence for one semester on Tuesday. You can. Uh, <laughs> You can see how jolly a group an executive committee of Bien can be. I'm sure it's still uh, like that uh, today. Luis, uh, now as a uh, co-chair of... Uh, uh, are you still enjoying yourself as members of uh, the Bien committee? <laughs> the one thing which I've never understood in, in this picture, I realized it in these 25 years, the length of my arms. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the, the first uh, speaker um, uh, so to explain how we should or could move forward is uh, Louise. Louise is co-chair of uh, Bien, to, together with uh, Carl Weinquist. Uh, we heard uh, Carl this morning. I asked, uh, so Bien is sort of collaborating in this uh, organization. They kindly uh, agreed to co-fund also uh, the uh, event uh, uh, today. And uh, I asked them uh, what could be the division of roles today. Uh, one should say the welcome word, word, and the other person should indicate how to move forward. And Louise immediately said, I want to indicate what is the way forward. <laughs> so what is it, Louise? Okay. Should I stay here? Or? You, you can stay up to you. So, I'll, I'll come up here. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think the political and possibly organizational challenges are for Bien and how they are connected. So as I said last week in Copenhagen, where we had a wonderful conference of the Nordic uh, affiliates of Bien, I think this year, and in fact this time, marks a turning point for Bien and for all of us who are involved in basic income activities. So Bien started, I think, in a very academic tra tradition about 30 years ago in an engagement of critique of the established welfare state that at that time was turning towards more unconditional, more conditioned forms of uh, workfare. And the tradition of critique that followed an abstract reasoning about alternative models that had served the tradition uh, or the movement very well. Um, however, I think through two subsequent iterations of phases of basic income advocacy, uh, we have moved on from that tradition and I think we need a new, an additional, more practical form of language to engage with what's happening at the moment. So after the, the uh, GAN became an international organization, there was a long period in which we engaged with the problem of uh, poverty in third world states during a period of time in which cash grants were being extended across Latin America and other countries of the world. And then we then, in the last four or five years, have come back to Europe and the debate in the Western world or the, the established democracies uh, after the Euro crisis and, of course, the 2008 crisis uh, as to how basic income can be, in a much more practical way, a solution or a, a further development of the established social state in this part the world. And it's in this context that I think we need to turn from a position of critique to a position of more of a positive dialogue with different groups and elements of that established social state. And that calls also, I think, for us, for some introspection um, in terms of how we deliver our message and also in terms of possibly going back to basics and actually thinking very clearly about what it is that's most important for us uh, in 
a transition in different times to roots in, towards a transition to a basic income. And this is especially important in the context of experiments and pilots that are going on at the moment, which in many ways, as Guy and others have indicated, I think, hold the risk for us of a fairly regressive, narrow discourse that focuses on behavioral effects, work incentive effects, and those sorts of issues that for many of us are not really the most central issues in terms of why it is that we want a basic income. The two most important arguments, I feel, in general, but that are also very important for us to push now, is the case of basic income in terms of basic human security. And this is a case we do not need pilots or experiments to make. Okay? I think, apart from the fact we actually have a wealth of information from existing studies that show that when people feel secure, when people have economic security, their sense of motivation, their sense of, of pride, and their sense of incentives to do things uh, is greater. We actually do not need pilots uh, to prove that. The second very important uh, reason for, for, to argue for basic income is in terms of what I call relational freedom. It's in terms of the transformation of social relationships between individuals and between institutions within society. So for me, it's very important to make that positive case to understand that basic income is in fact a piece in the puzzle of re-democratizing the social state in the de developed world. Not necessarily the solution to all our problems, but a very important piece in the puzzle that can help transform the relationships between institutions and between people. And I will just give an example from that Nordic conference, because Denmark is experimenting, or municipalities in Denmark are experimenting with basic income in a, what I would say, a fairly spontaneous way, without actually conducting pilots as such, without necessarily uh, investing in that kind of scientific experiment. But because in municipalities, specifically in the north of Jutland of Aarhus, the um, social uh, uh, bureaucracy there decided that they didn't think the way that they were giving money to people on conditional terms of activation programs and so on was working. So they decided they would try and lift the conditions. And they did it in a very small way, only with about a uh, hundred or a little over a hundred people. And they monitored the effects, both on the recipients and on the social assistance uh, bureaucrats and what their feelings were. And on both, both types of effects were very interesting. And, and the fact that they thought about not just the effects on the income recipients, but the effects on the state officials, I thought was, was very telling, uh, of, of what actually is valuable in many ways about the established welfare state and why we might want to trust some of the institutions that have delivered universal social security, in, particularly in the Nordic states, very well in the course of period, why we might want to trust them to actually come up with some of these ideas and, and, and therefore, our, our, our role should be to support them, not, not to present the basic income necessarily as a complete break with the past. And so what were the sort of effects? In terms of the hundred or so uh, people, sorry, that received unconditional uh, payments for a year, there were a variety of effects. Not all good, some positive, some negative. And what the social bureaucrats who presented the paper there at the conference told me was that they, they thought it would take time. And that is a precisely, uh, I think, uh, a very revealing point that they realized that it would take uh, a while. Some set up a small business, some uh, decided to devote more time to care for their children and so on. We had some of the same effects that you've seen in, in other pilots elsewhere. But the really interesting point for me was the effect on the bureaucrats. Uh, so the bureaucrats who were interviewed said, well, I, I really like this new way of working with citizens. Because now I feel that the citizens are my equal. When they come, we still have discussions about what it is that they might want to do in their lives, and we want to remain involved in that, but now I am talking to them as a friend, no longer as, uh, no, I'm not talking to them as if they are my clients. And also very interestingly, in the Danish debate, there is a new party called Alterna The Alternative, and they have precisely this, uh, route to basic income as a policy that they're developing. Okay, so they are proposing, just as a first step, to remove the conditionalities. 
which I think is really very, very interesting, because for me, that is the most difficult part, actually. It's not the finance part. It's this idea that people can get assistance without demands. And that's what they call it, assistance without demand. Okay? Uh, and then, uh, as a sort of realistic appraisal of the situation, they don't intend to go any further as a first step, but they are indicating that they want to eventually universalize uh, the system. But what is also interesting is that the MP who, who uh, presented on this policy and who's very uh, passionate about it, uh, he also wanted equally passionately to stress that he was not, he did not think that we should forget about people when they got these unconditional payments. That he intended to use the existing uh, resources of the public sector to keep involving or trying to create opportunities for people and going back and visiting them and, and seeing that, that the, the collaboration between citizens and the involvement of citizens in cooperative projects would remain important. And that was equally important to him to stress that. In other words, I see my, my, my time is up. I think that the challenge for us is to engage with these things that are happening. They may not be perfect basic income experiments, they may not be the, the full basic income that, that we want, but there are things happening spontaneously around Europe and elsewhere, and certainly SBN, we will be engaging with the Nordic states. And, and the other thing we will do is engage with the new types of movements that are springing up, um, time banking, alternative agriculture, local markets, local countries. We are currently SBN engaging with them, uh, and we are setting up task forces SBN as well to try and involve more of our own affiliates and members and bring in um, new groups uh, within the activities that we do. So, Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. For those who haven't been here since the beginning, so after five minutes there is a little bell ringing, and after seven minutes there is there is a klaxon. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Stanislas Jourdan, in fact. Uh, to be uh, honest, the, uh, our gender ratio would have been uh, even better today if um, the first choice for this position uh, uh, had been possible. That is, we first invited uh, Barbara Jacobson, who uh, is the current president of uh, Universal uh, Unconditional Basic Income Europe, the new uh, basic income uh, network that was formed in the aftermath of uh, the uh, European Citizens Initiative. But uh, Barbara was engaged uh, in Denmark today, in uh, Copenhagen, so she couldn't come. And uh, the next best option was the other co-founder of real co-founder. There were many co-founders, but there was one particularly energetic, efficient, reliable uh, associate the sort of person you dream to have uh, in a network, and that was Stanislav. And so, um, and so Stanislav is now based in Brussels, so it's even cheaper to make him come here, and, uh, and, uh, and is also involved, in, which is uh, very relevant, it's a question which Klaus was also asking, in a campaign that's called quantitative easing for the people, and which is not unrelated to basic income. So we have Although you are a second choice, we are very pleased that you are here. <laughs> and I'm very, very pleased to and quite honored, actually. Thank you, Philip, for the kind words. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah? Yes. yeah? Okay. Um, so, my journey with basic income started in 2010, so not too long ago, compared to many of you. Uh, it started as many good stories involving great ideas in a bar. Uh, with random meeting with a, with a guy who had an interesting theory about money and that you could give free money to people. And I was actually, I immediately embraced the idea because I was a young, frustrated student in business, not really having a clue about politics and quite feeling quite disappointing about the split, quite unproductive split between the left, the, the left and the right. And so basically, it immediately struck me as a good compromise between the two. Um, so I came back from that meeting in a bar and I realized that, okay, it's a great idea, there seems to be quite a few documentations about that, but how many are we? How many are we? I'm, I'm alone in front of my computer now. Uh, and I think that's the main challenge as a movement that we need to, 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 to overcome, to create a number, to create a community. Um, so for a while I did my own research and I started to blog about this idea and, and I could see the traction behind it. And at some point I received an email forwarded 
from someone who forwarded it from someone about a certain meeting in Brussels, in, actually in the European Parliament. Um, and I went there uh, for the first time. And he, the, uh, so the, the goal of this meeting was to set up a big European campaign, a European Citizens Initiative. A European Citizens Initiative is a, was a new instrument at the time in the EU, very <coughs> new, where if you get one million signatures, you could present your idea at the, at the European uh, Commission. Um, in this room at the European Parliament, um, I must say I was probably one of the youngest people, uh, like today. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and the challenge was, you know, uh, there was never been such a big campaign in Europe, and especially in, uh, the, at the continental level, and the challenge was really high, and I felt like, are we capable of doing this? Um, and I, I had my doubts, but I, I thought, okay, I, at least I could try to help. <laughs> and I ended up having to organize the next meeting, obviously. Um, and from there, uh, it's been a big journey. Um, I've, I became so passionate that I decided that I was... I was quite privileged, actually, because I had some money on my back. I was a freelancer. I could decide to basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, change my schedule and, and be quite flexible. But I, I even decided to go even further. I quit my apartment in Paris and became a nomad for a year and a half, so I could travel around, meet the activists, um, meet journalists, organize events, um, you know, support the local groups who were, were interested in uh, joining the campaign. And uh, we, I even went several times to meet with uh, members of the European Parliament. Um, so at the end of the day, we finished this campaign with 300,000 signatures, which was much less than the goal of 1 million, but it was also much higher than uh, I think many people expected we could get from the beginning. Um, we, and and we, we also got many tangible results at, at many other levels. We started this campaign with about 15 countries involved, and we ended up having 10 more countries uh, where, where activists on the ground were creating signatures. Um, just to tell one example, in Bulgaria suddenly we got contacted by a few activists, and uh, a few months later, after some cooperation with Guy Standing, we got the Bulgarian trade union, the main federation there, we supported the campaign. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of things you get uh, when you have a little bit of resource, uh, people with time, and uh, a lot of patience and a lot of connections, we can get something. Um, and yeah, and I believe actually this campaign is still the biggest petition on, on UBI, on basic income that never, uh, never existed. But this campaign was just, it was clear from the beginning that it was just a first step. It was not the goal in the end. We knew that we probably would not get nothing out of the EU anyway. It was just the first step to build something bigger. So the next step was to build uh, Unconditional Basic Game Europe, or UBIE, um, as uh, Philip said. Um, and so this was not without challenges. We wanted to organize a, a proper organization to keep uh, working together. Um, but the challenges were really broad. Um, how do we structure ourselves? What kind of governance? What is our charter? And you know, all these kind of things. Uh, what resources can we build up? Uh, what capacity do we have? And ultimately, uh, also, what, what are the exact goals we are pursuing uh, and what kind of activities do we want to carry on? And those questions are still partly unresolved. Um, but what, what is true is that thanks to this process, uh, there's now a lively community that's meeting every three months. Uh, and by the way, we are going to meet in Madrid in a few weeks and you are all welcome to join. Um, the, um, so that, that's for the, the UBIE. Um, Later in January 2015, the European Central Bank started this quantitative easing thing. Who does know what quantitative easing is in this, in this room? Quite, okay, not, quite not everyone. So basically, the European Central Bank is creating money, now 80 billions every month, and is buying bonds on the market, so they are basically pumping money, more money into the financial markets. Um, so when I first heard about it, I thought, wait a minute, where is this money going? What's going to be the effect? And actually there's been lots of evidence from the UK, from the US Federal Reserve, that actually this is not stimulating so much the economy, this is actually increasing inequality. And then I did some math, and I realized that actually if you split the money by citizens in the, in the Eurozone, that would make about 200 euros per month for a year and a half. I don't know, it kind of sounds like a busy income, doesn't it? Um, so we thought, okay, like, we could actually do a campaign, Let's call it quantitative easing for people, 
Um, and that's what we did. And we fought actually many, many other organizations that are not just basic human mobilization, but other organizations, anti austerity movements, could be interested in that. And that, that we, we started to contact those organizations. And I, I contacted in particular one, which is called Positive Money, which is a UK based organization, and, and they, are, they have been working on monetary policy for a while. And they, they like the idea. In fact, they even they like the idea so much that they hired me to, to do this campaign. And I'm now working for them. Um, and also on behalf of PBIE because this, this is a coalition work. Um, the, um, what we achieved so far with this campaign, uh, we've got a coalition of 20 organizations supporting this idea. Uh, more than 100 something economists signed it, signed the manifesto, and we are now, um, now that in Brussels, I'm actually having frequent conversation with uh, members of the parliament and overall 50 of them are somehow interested in discussing about it so we're making progress um, so to look for what? I think what I'm telling you this is that from my experience when you have good ideas that have political relevance when we have capacity to have people working actually full time uh, and when we're patient we can achieve political leverage um, so what's next? what's next? We have to seize opportunities. Uh, we have to do campaigns around opportunities. That's my key point. And right now in Europe, I cannot tell what's the opportunities in your national country, but what's for sure is that we have a massive, uh, massive EU crisis, which we can use as opportunities in many ways. Just to give you a few examples, um, the one I just mentioned is the the, the quantitative easing. Um, so there's a lot of discussion right now about helicopter money, which is exactly the same thing, giving East central banks giving money to people. Um, and why it's an opportunity for the basic income conversation? Because it's actually uh, addressing, this is actually an idea that could solve a lot of the issues with the financial sector now. Uh, not everything, but this allows us to bring basic income conversation with a completely different framework, uh, which allows us to bridge and to reach completely new experts, new policy makers, and so on. The second, um, the second possibility I see is that now that we have the Finnish government involving in some Beijing experiment, and especially with the fact that it's not so great, <laughs> uh, we c I think we, there's potential for leveraging this and scaling up the Beijing experiment at the EU level. Like, in fact, just last week, the EU Commissioner on Social Affairs said she is following closely the, the Finnish experiment. So I think there's a case to me today that the EU, okay, admittedly the EU cannot implement a Basingham right now, but they can surely donate, they can surely fund many uh, of the pilots, and it would be much better if we have more different pilots, we can get more different results, and we can compare them uh, instead of just relying and just looking at one particular experiment. Um, and thirdly, um, and last. The, yeah, and last. <laughs> The, uh, the, the monetary union in Europe is strongly imbalanced and is a great case to be made that the basic government and especially Philip's proposal for a year dividend could solve many of the imbalances within the Eurozone. And I think we, sh we, we should bring that idea uh, more into the conversation on, uh, on the future of the Euro um, as, a, as a very simple way to have uh, transfers across member states. Um, so that's it. I think just to open up maybe the discussion, I think what we need to, to, to look for are the, the opportunities. Where are they? What are, where, where, where can we be politically relevant? And then turning into campaigns. That's my key point. We need to turn into campaigning mode, which means seeking realistic but ambitious objectives. Thanks. Yasmin Kerabash is a member of uh, the Flemish uh, Parliament, so it's a regional parliament, but it's a region that happens to be uh, about 60% of, uh, of uh, the country. She is a member of uh, the Flemish uh, Socialist Party. As uh, was already mentioned by Philippe de Fay this morning, uh, the Socialist uh, Party in Belgium, and more than the Swiss one, for example, as we heard, is uh, uh, divided to some extent, but with a large majority within the social family being opposed uh, to uh, basic income. On the Francophone side, we had a bit of a public uh, controversy, as uh, Yasmin well knows, because one of our 
ex-colleagues uh, and a friend of several of us in, uh, in this room, Paul Magnet, uh, now Minister President of the Walloon region, came out in, uh, uh, in the course of an interview by saying that uh, l'allocation universelle, c'est uh, le sens de l'histoire. So basic income, that's the direction of history. And uh, uh, shortly afterwards, the boss, the current boss of, uh, of his party, who was also that means boss, immediate boss, because he was uh, his direct uh, his, uh, director of cabinet when he was prime minister, Elio Di Rupo. So Yasmin was uh, his uh, chief of cabinet uh, at the time. So Elio Di Rupo came out uh, immediately. We, and peut-être pour un avenir lointain, but uh, in the immediate future, it's a uh, danger for social security. But Yasmin is one of uh, these uh, socialists uh, who think uh, and, uh, and, who, and who say and who say what uh, uh, what they think, including when uh, it doesn't please everyone around them. It happened to her in the Antwerp context, and it will happen to her again today because she said, "Don't expect me to say things that everyone will like in the room." So please, <laughs> uh, thank you for being there. <laughs> thank you for the nice introduction. I, uh, it was with, in fact with great pleasure that I accepted the invitation to, uh, to participate in this debate because um, it gives me at least the opportunity to clarify the position of my party, the Social Democrats, uh, with respect to the basic income. Mainly, Social Democrats are considered as... Uh, rather skeptical, and put it mildly, rather skeptical towards the idea of a basic income. Certainly when the basic income is presented as an alternative for uh, the existing social security systems, then uh, the fear is that uh, a basic income is part of a neoliberal agenda, uh, asking or uh, wanting a minimal, a minimal state and uh, wanting also then a minimum social security. In this sense, um, welcoming the basic income is considered as welcoming, and I quote, a Trojan horse that will destroy the social welfare as we know it. That's a quote from your ex-boss, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, is that social democratic skepsis legitimate? Well, first of all, in times of uh, austerity, globalization, um, rising migration, which all puts pressure on, uh, on the welfare states, there are, of course, good reasons to defend our social security systems. One of these good reasons is that social welfare states managed better to, um, um, uh, uh, to manage to, 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 to not to rise, uh, uh, to not let, let rise uh, poverty and inequality in times of crisis. For instance, for instance Belgium uh, is one of these examples of uh, a social welfare state where um, inequality didn't rise uh, in the period of, of crisis. So defending social welfare, social security and social welfare states is, is legitimate and is uh, in these times even necessary. Even uh, when we see that, uh, for instance, in, in Belgium with the right-wing government now, they put a lot of pressure on our social welfare state. But, in my opinion, um, it doesn't mean that a basic income system must automatically be seen as a threat to our social welfare system. On the contrary, in my opinion, a well-designed basic income can reinforce a social security system. How? Not by replacing the um, existing systems, not by uh, replacing the three pillars of our social welfare state, social investment, social uh, assistance and social security, but by uh, integrated it in uh, our social security system. Because we have to acknowledge that the safety net of our social insurance system is weakening. We see that too much people do not benefit from a basic social security coverage, 
because of the complexity of the system today. There are a lot of people also not um, protected enough because uh, of the changing of the economy uh, due to change also of the labor market. So um, I think that also social democrats which are really very, very attached to their the social welfare state must be more open-minded and open a debate to find a way to introduce a mechanism of basic income. Now, I see two ways, two first steps, in which the idea of a basic income can effectively be implemented to reinforce our social welfare states. The first way, I think, is um, to try to implement a universal, substantial child benefit. I think it's important now because um, we see that child poverty is rising, and we see also the politically, in the political debate, that uh, uh, with regard to child benefit, and in fact with regard to other benefits, there is a, um, a rise of um, replacing social benefits by more means-tested benefits. I think that is the completely wrong way to go. More means-tested social benefits is creating a poverty gap, it's creating more complexity. Though. So I think that's not the right way. I think if we want to tackle poverty, and certainly um, child poverty, we'll have to accept that giving cash helps. Of course, together with other, um, uh, uh, other social investments in education and childcare and so on. Another uh, way of, a uh, second way of implementing and guaranteeing a minimum income is by implementing a minimum income for all participating to the social welfare state. I refer here to the participation income of Anthony Atkinson's. Uh, he calls it a participation income in his book, Inequality, What Can Be Done? And he explains, and I, I, I think that's a, an interesting uh, reasoning or uh, uh, argumentation. He said, well, a participation income differs from the classic notion of basic income in two respects. First, it would complement existing social transfer, ra transfers rather than replace them. So that's the idea of integrating it in the social security system. Secondly, the entitlement is not linked on citizenship, but on participation. And you mentioned that, oh, what is it? What does that mean, participation? Well, participation has to be defined broadly as making a social contribution, which for those of working age could be uh, full-time work or part-time work or self-employment, but it can also be education, can be uh, participating, participating in training, but also care uh, or voluntary work. By linking a minimum income to a broad notion of participation, a wider range of activities in society are evaluated, such as care and voluntary work, without the complex, existing complex bureaucratic rules uh, with respect to the different types of career interruption for care or education. Such a minimum income gives also a minimum of security to those starting an activity uh, with an uncertain output. Uh, think of artists, that was the first time 20 years ago that I was starting to think on a basic income when I was trying to develop a status for the artists. But another activity with an uncertain income are research activities, and, but, uh, but not when you are a professor. Um, moreover, it gives you uh, such a minimum income, a more uh, income stability. And in a, that's important in the context of rising job and income insecurity. Well, why do I prefer a minimum income linked to participation instead of basic income linked to citizenship? I think that participation is a more fairer and adequate criterion than citizenship to determine who's entitled to such a basic income. You can be a citizen of a country, even when you live abroad. And you can be a migrant, on the other hand, living, working, participating to society without being considered formally as a citizen. In my opinion, it is more legitimate to uh, grant a minimum income to, help, to all who participate to society than to those who formally 
belong to society without actually living or participating in it. Certainly, and that's important in times of globalization and increasing uh, migration, it's important to find a legitimate criterion, avoiding, for instance, that a, a tourist could claim a basic income, but also avoiding a dual society with citizens entitled to a basic income and migrants not. See, for instance, the guaranteed income um, scheme for families uh, in the district of Brasilia imposes a residence period of at least 10 years of, for instance, the, um, the uh, Iranian uh, um, sort of basic income. It's limited to Iranians, and in fact, Iranians head of households, so it's mostly men. But it's limited to Iranian citizens, so excluding non-Iranian citizens, mostly Iraqi and Afghan refugees. <clears throat> so therefore, let's avoid that a good idea as a basic income ends up as being an exclusive instrument creating a dual society. Such a dual society is certainly not my Ethiopia. Therefore, let's make some major steps forward towards a global universal basic income via a universal child benefit and a universal participation income. Thank you. Our fourth uh, panelist is uh, Roland. I met Roland for the first time with uh, several of us uh, here when he came uh, to one of the Bien Congresses, I think it was the one held at Goldsmiths College in uh, London in uh, 92, perhaps, uh, some, something like that. And, uh, 94. 94, in 94, I think 92 was in Paris. And, um, and uh, he was, uh, we noticed it was a businessman, a bit unusual in this sort of uh, encounter, but very curious to learn and to go from one seminar to the other. And, and uh, he was sort of convinced before, but he came out of the Congress even more, uh, more convinced than before. And then if I understood that properly, he did also something which uh, few people would ever have dreamt of uh, doing. I probably simplify a bit the story. One day he gathers his children and he said, look children, with part of what I have, I could do two things. One is to buy a yacht, which you could also enjoy, and the other one is to create a political party which would defend uh, a particular idea which I became, uh, which I became convinced of, um, namely basic income. And his kid said, come on daddy, you have your pet idea, you have your obsession, go your way, create your party, and that's what became uh, Vivant. And uh, uh, Roland, as a result of that, went into politics, but uh, discovered that uh, politics was not really a thing. It's a hard world, isn't it? It's it does mean and, uh, and, uh, it was even it was better to be uh, back an industrialist uh, and uh, and uh, be the real boss in his firm. Rather, it's more difficult to be the boss in a country. And even owning a football club can be a hard job, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. So thank you, Philip. So as a matter of fact, with this political party, we got one vote in 40 in Belgium, which was not bad, uh, knowing that uh, we were not allowed on television, we were not allowed to make even paid publicity on television, we were not allowed to make many publicities in the press, because in fact, the political system in any country in Europe is a kind of oligopoly, where they defend their own uh, kind of uh, power, and uh, that's a big problem. I wasn't aware of that. I was very stupid to create a political party and so forth. Huh? And that's the reason why we should not rely too much on political parties. As Alexander Dero said already earlier today, huh? he said, okay, be aware that the political class will never say something to the electorate if the electorate is not convinced. Which basically means we have to convince the electorate and the electorate has to convince the political people. That's the way it works. And therefore, I'm not going to speak to you about the benefits of basic income, because we are all convinced of that. I'm rather going to try to 
give you a message which you, which you can convey to, uh, in debates and in other, uh, in other discussions you may have to, uh, to go the next step. Because I also believe now we need the next step. And the next step is to say there is no alternative. <laughs> the present labor-based system, the welfare system, which Alexander Duro mentioned as well, is failing. Is really failing. Yeah. Now you must be aware that the system which we now see as a, a kind of religion, that we need jobs, jobs, and that we need uh, capital and all these things. This system, best friends, is a very, very young system. It dates back about 150 years maximum. The clock in uh, firms, uh, it was introduced about 1850, 1, which is about 150 years ago. Before that, there was not a labor hour because they didn't measure the hours. In fact, the paid labor, in terms of paying for labor, is a very young concept in humanity. Former, formerly, in fact, they paid in kind, for example, uh, people and so forth. And if you look to the system of the paid labor, it's, and if you would say, okay, the history of mankind is one day, well, the system of paid labor is 26 minutes. And then if you think about capital, capital is a concept which was basically started to be discussed really in the, in the sense of, of the capital we know now, with Marx and Engels in the, also in the late 19th century. It's about the same kind of scale of time. But the problem today is that the whole political world, the whole economic world, believes in that religion, believes in the religion of work, was a whole history of mankind was about helping each other and not paying for work. We did help each other thousand years ago, five hundred years ago. And now we are in a system which is a sick system. We need to come back to the values defended by all values of basic income, sharing things with each other, each other distributing money to each, to each other. That's the real value of the humanity and of humankind. So I think now that we have to be aware that if you look at how things came about in the recent past, these 150 years, we created something magnificent, which is social security. It was the biggest invention of mankind. It came from the labor unions. No problem with that. I think it's a fantastic invention, but it is under great danger now. It did evolve due to the fact that in the last century, and especially the last part of the last <coughs> century, the productivity gains in companies and in agriculture were so high that it allowed to increase not only the net salaries of the people and the purchasing power of the people working in those factories, but it also allowed us to pay for education, healthcare, and all these other things. Now, since about 10 years, in the post-internet period, which we're engaged in now, we see that the net income of the working class is stalling. It's not increasing anymore. In Holland, in Belgium, everywhere. It's finished. Why? Because if you look at the jobs which are still available today, there are very few jobs left which can support taxes. And the problem is, best friends, that the social security is being based on taxes on labor. And, for example, for all the people working in public service, they are paid by the state, and the wallet which pays for the social security of these people is the same wallet collecting them. So the net contribution is zero. Same for education, and same for all the subsidized things we have today. 
what is what is left is of course the private sector which is decreasing gradually in importance because in fact robots computers and support are replacing dramatically all the jobs in industry with as a result that the contributions we get to finance the social security is under great pressure and you hear now even political parties saying we should reduce social security my friends we have to do the opposite because that's the strength of the future we are rich enough aren't we we are rich enough if all these robots these computers which which are producing all these goods for us do it just for us it's paradise but we are not capable of organizing ourselves well i mean the people defending the religion of the workfare and the and the labor doctrine they are wrong and we have to convince them that the future is just distribute money distribute purchasing power and purchasing power has to become the motor of the wealth because distributing purchasing power will yield activity will yield entrepreneurship and will yield also for those who want to work work I think. Mm -hmm.